So then let's consider first of all what is a mind in the grip of vicious circles. Well, one of the most obvious instances that we all know is the phenomenon of worry. The doctor tells you that you have to have an operation. And that has been set up so that automatically everybody worries about it. But since worrying takes away your appetite and your sleep, it's not good for you. So the doctor tells you not to worry because he wants you on the operating table in a state of good health, well rested, etc. But you can't stop worrying and therefore you get additionally worried that you are worrying and therefore will not be in the right shape to be on the operating table. And then furthermore, because that is quite absurd and you are mad at yourself because you do it, you are worried because you worry because you worry. That is a vicious circle. Another form of vicious circle is when a person is convinced that they ought to be unselfish and are so convinced for selfish reasons. I would like to think of myself as an unselfish person because that's the sort of person I'm supposed to be. So therefore I have a selfish reason for wanting to be unselfish and because of that no amount of effort will ever succeed in making me unselfish but will only succeed in sending me around in circles. I'll be proud that I'm humble. <laughs> Etc. <laughs> that is citta vritti, turnings of the mind. See? So now, yoga is initially stopping that. Can you allow your mind to be quiet? Isn't it difficult? Because the mind seems to be like a monkey, jumping up and down and jabbering all the time. Once you've learned to think, you can't stop. And an enormous number of people devote their lives to keeping their minds busy and feel extremely uncomfortable with silence. When you're alone, say in a doctor's waiting room, which may be very uninteresting, nobody's saying anything, there's nothing to do, there's this, this worry. This uh, lack of distraction. I'm left alone with myself. And I want to get away from myself. I'm always wanting to get away from myself. That's why I go to the movies. That's why I read mystery stories. That's why I go after to girls or anything that you do or get drunk or whatever. I don't want to be with myself. I feel queer. I feel like, uh, you know how it is when you run your fingernails up a blackboard on a cold day? <laughs> Creeping. So, well, why do you want to run away from yourself? What's so bad about it? Why do you want to forget this? Why do you want to become absorbed? Because you are addicted to thoughts. And this is a drug, a real dangerous one. Compulsive thinking going on and on and on and on and on all the time. It's a habit. As you keep telling yourself where you are, who you are, what's going on, how good it is, how bad it is, reading the newspaper of your mind. You know a lot of people, they get hold of a newspaper and the newspaper reads them, they don't read it. <laughs> newspaper is designed to read you. Typographers, the layout people, have very carefully calculated how to carry your eye from one end of it to another. So there's a difficulty about stopping that activity. And you really have to stop it if you want to be sane. Because if I talk all the time, I don't hear what anyone else has to say. And then I'll end up in the situation of having nothing to talk about but my own talking. Or so in exactly the same way, if I think all the time, I won't have anything to think about except thoughts. And that's the academic fallacy. See, when you add books to the library, a great many of the books that are added to the library are books about books. They're not necessarily books about life. Some of them are, 
but most of the books, especially PhD dissertations, are books about books about books about books. And that doesn't really get us very far. So in order to have something to think about, there are times when you simply must stop thinking. You can learn later on in yoga how to be in the state of samadhi and think at the same time. But first of all, you have to learn how to stop thinking. Well, how do you do that? The first rule is don't try to. Because if you do, you will be like someone trying to make rough water smooth with a flat iron. And all that will do will stir it up. So in the same way as a muddy, turbulent pool quiets itself when left alone, you have to know how to leave your mind alone. It will quiet itself. There are certain things, however, which help. And the yogis tend to use two techniques for assisting their minds to become calm. One is breathing. That is called pranayama. Prana means breath or the vital force of the body. Pranayama, the discipline of breath. And the other is called mantra. It's, all, it's connected with pranayama. It's connected with breathing, but it's uh, chanting, chanting sounds. And both of these have a slightly auto-hypnotic effect, which helps one to quiet thoughts. Um, these days, many hippies go around wearing beads. Anybody got beads on? What do you wear beads for? Do you know why you wear them? Do you know what beads are for? Beads are for yoga. This is a Tibetan rosary, which has been blessed by the Dalai Lama. And uh, they um, wear them on the hand, rather. Well, they carry them around the neck, but they usually use them in the hand. And they will do for timing. You've got your yoga practice for the day, and so many rounds of the beads will time you. And either you use the beads for breathing, in, out on one bead, in, out on the next bead, in, out on the next bead, and so. Now they have uh, essentially, the breathing in yoga is not forced. You don't do kind of breathing exercises in a forced way. You have, first of all, to find out how your lungs want to breathe. Let them do that and count your breath with your fingers rather than using numbers. Try and keep away from concepts, and numbers are concepts. That's why you use your fingers on the beads instead. And for every in-breath and out-breath, you use one bead. Just experiencing breathing and experiencing the sensation of the beads passing your fingers. Don't think about it. Don't try not to think about it. But uh, the, the bead and the breathing will distract you from thinking. And you will find that in due course, the breath will automatically become slower and slower and slower with great ease until it seems that you are hardly breathing at all, it's so slow. Now, for some people, that is not so easy to concentrate on. And so it makes it easier to concentrate if you add to the breathing a mantra. And uh, so the mantra means the chanting of certain syllables which although they do have a meaning, and they are maybe the names of the divinity, they very soon cease to have a meaning as you use them. So uh, the Tibetans use such a mantra as 
Just with beats, Ram, 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 or uh, more complicated ones, Om Ram, Shri Ram, Jai Jai Ram, Om Ram, Shri Ram, Jai Jai Ram, Om Ram, Shri Ram, Jai Jai Ram, all such things, or. Uh, Many, many varieties of these mantras. And if you keep doing that, you find you're getting into another state of consciousness. You're not thinking in the ordinary way. As the words, let's take any English word, take the word yes. We know, we think we know, yeah, yes means, it means yes, you know, I will. But say it several times, yes, yes, yes. Yes. And strike you, we use that funny noise. Yes. 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 And after a while it stops meaning anything. This becomes a noise. And that's the way you, through using thought symbols, you free the mind from thought. It's like using a thorn to pick out a thorn that's stuck in the skin. So, uh, yoga uses those. And breathing. to help the mind to become quite still. Mm-hmm.